watched you before they can get into it. Yeah, everyone on YouTube has to watch an advert. Okay, so we are live on YouTube. We are live on Zoom. Welcome to the Side Hustle Workshop. And my big promise for you today is that by the end of this workshop, if you don't have a side hustle, you will have a plan of how to go forwards and how to test your first idea. That's the plan, is to get you actually started making money on the side. And making extra money, that's what this workshop is all about. The series of videos we've been doing has been about increasing the gap between your income and your spending so that you can invest more. This is one on helping to make extra money. And one of my favorite expressions, which comes from a favorite speaker, is money isn't that important, but it's right up there with oxygen. Like it's quite useful to buy food, water, housing. So let's work out how we can help you make more. Here is the total overview of the workshop, what we're gonna to do tonight. Number one is the concept of mini experiments. Two is funding your side hustle. How do you get cash to do it? Three is types of side hustle, which is all the ideas for you. Four, your first mini experiment and how to run it. Then the keys to starting and getting going. Six, developing an offer, taking action, and then evaluating the mini experiment afterwards. So that's the entire plan for tonight. Uh, Morag in the chat says, hoping for hustles without much hassle. Uh, there will always be challenges, but let's make this as easy as possible. Number one, the surprising power of mini experiments. A mini experiment is a small test of an idea to get it out there to see if it works. And the reason we use the word experiment is to allow you to know that some of your experiments will fail or you will get data that says it hasn't worked. And that is okay because it's just an experiment. So a question for you all, please put it in the chat. What is the only way to know if your business will work or not? Like most people tend to go, oh, I've got a business idea. I'll talk to my friends. I'll uh, do a market survey. I'll do all those different things. Like, what's the only true way to know if your business idea will work or not? Andy says, give it a go. Donna says, do it. Uh, Jack says, try it. Like, what does that actually mean, though? What does try it mean? What does do it mean? Satam says, pilot it. Lucy says, give it a go. Uh, Lewis says, sales. Dora says, test it. Like, what, Katie? Marie says you don't know. Marie says you don't know. Exactly. The only way to know, you don't know whether it'll work until you have a go. But what does that actually mean? Most people, let's imagine I came up with an idea for a new mobile phone case. So I've designed a new mobile phone case. Uh, if I did what most people do, I would go to my friends, or as Mark O'Donnell says, I would do research. So I'd go to my friends and said, I've come up with this idea. What do you think? Do you like my idea? And your friends will say, yeah, the idea is great. Or no, nah, I think I, no one will buy that. They'll give you some kind of feedback. Is that useful feedback? Same as research. You go out on the street and you do the research and you go out with your clipboard and go, I have my idea. Would you buy this? And then people say, yes, I'll buy it because they'll be nice to you. But the key is you don't actually know until you ask someone for the money. So whether it's your friend or the person on the street, you have to look at them and go, great. It's 20 pounds. Would you like to buy one? And then you pause and you're silent until you get a response for them. The only way you know, the only moment of truth is when you ask someone for the money for the item. Up until that point, they will be nice to you, especially in British culture. Like we are trained not to be mean to people. You have to actually ask for the money to get the real response. Like when you say, would you buy this? They'll be nice to you. If you say, hand me 20 pounds right now and you can have one, you will get the real answer in a split second. So the only way to know is to test it. So we always do this bit of Rebel Business School, which is what's the number one secret 
to starting a business, the secret, because everyone's always after the secret, the way to skip ahead, the way to get ahead early. They want the secret. Well, for me, it's really simple. The secret is sell something to someone. If you have sold something to someone, you have a business. What our job is, is to define what is the something and who is the someone. That's the secret source. Because if you know who your market is and what the something is, then you have a business. Uh, Jack says, buy from me, which I love. Uh, Jack, what are you selling? And Mary says, the secret to a business is selling something. That is exactly it. It's sales. So let me give you the process for a mini experiment just to make this clear. For us, step one is coming up with an idea. You'll normally be in one of three camps. You will have lots of business ideas, but you don't know which one to choose. You will have a business idea you've been thinking about for possibly 30 years. You just need to know how to get going. Or you'll be the person who goes, I just don't know where to start, what idea to do. But no matter which group you're in, we will show you how to come up with an idea. But you just choose one. The secret is it doesn't really matter which one. Then you develop a picture, a prototype. So we a title, a description, maybe a picture, an information price. We get it ready. We choose our target audience, which is just our best guess of who might buy. And then we sell them the idea. We market it. We ask directly for the money. Will you buy? Because that's the only really way we can test whether your idea is going to work or not is if someone says yes to you. So we actually have to ask for the money. Once we've asked for the money, and we've done this experiment, we can then evaluate it. And the evaluation is basically three things. But the main one is, did anyone buy from you? So you developed your pitch, you came up with your idea, you put it out to the marketplace, you asked them to buy. Did people buy? If yes, well, we have a business, let's develop it. If no, what went wrong? And let's learn from it and start again. And the idea is, as quickly as you can test your ideas, the better, because your first idea probably won't be your best idea. Do you think the first business I ever set up was my million dollar money winning million pound business? Or did I screw it up many times before I got there? <laughs> And it's quite interesting. People think you're going to be successful first time. The idea is actually to get through the bad ideas as quickly as possible so you can get to your good idea and keep going. Uh, so we're going to move on to section two, which is funding your side hustle, which some of you might be scratching your head. I thought Alan always talks about how to start a business for free. And I do. You don't need funding. But basically what people think is they think they have to create everything before they sell it. That's why they think they need funding. They want to write the entire book before they sell it. They want to create the product or the thing before they sell it. They want to build the business structure of the business. I need money for the solicitors and the logo and this. They want to create everything first. They want to write the whole course before selling it, rent the office space, they just want to buy everything and spend their money before they do it. And this is the reason why lots of people in the UK end up with garages full of stuff they can't sell. Because they like create a bunch of T-shirts and go, my business is going to be T-shirts. They print all the T-shirts, then they go out to the market and they find no one wants them. Then years later, they're giving them away to their nieces and nephews because no one wants them. My idea is to reverse that and do it the other way round to sell before you create. But that's not how we're taught to do business in the UK or America or most of the Western world. The traditional approach is to make a list of everything you need to start a business and then to get a loan from someone, the bank, friends, family, to be able to borrow the money to be able to start. And that is starting a business in debt. Uh, interesting side question. Do you know who the number one funder of business training, entrepreneurship, startup support in the world is? 
Do you know who funds all the training? Any ideas? What do you think? Councils, universities, housing associations, who funds it? There's some shrugging going on here. Donna says the taxpayer. Uh, Daniel says banks. Uh, Daniel has got it right. It is banks. And how do banks make money? Lending you money. So is it any wonder that startup support starts with how much money do you need to borrow to get going? Louise and Ella say banks and the lenders. That's exactly it. They teach you how to borrow money. Like it's a really smart business model. If I was a bank, I'd be teaching everyone to borrow money. That would be a great way to make money. Uh, so we're going to say don't do that. And one of Katie's favorite expressions is never ask a barber if you need a haircut. Exactly. So don't ask a bank if you need a loan. Don't ask a butcher if you need a steak. Don't ask a barber if you need a haircut. You, They will always tell you you do. You don't need money to afford this stuff. So the rebel method is sell before you create. What does that mean? If you've got an idea, let's say you're going to do a T-shirt company. Why don't we design one T-shirt virtually and then try and sell it from the picture? If people buy from the picture, then we can print the T-shirts that they want. It doesn't matter what it is you want to build, create or do. There is a way to sell it before you have created it. Uh, Craig says about the minimum viable product uh, from the book Lean Startup. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I would say like the minimum viable product, sometimes you don't even need the product. You just need the idea to be able to sell it. And the most extreme version of this, can you sell a house before it's created? Could you sell a house before it's built? I don't know if you've ever seen this, but people will walk you around a blank patch of land and go, this is where your kitchen will be. This is where the window is and you'll get a view of the mountains and this will be where this is. And they sell off plan, exactly as Flower Patch says. Like they sell the house before it's created and then they use your deposits and your money to start building it. That's the basic principle is use the customer's money to build your business, not debt. And if you can sell a house before you create it, I don't care what it is. Someone in the chat said, could you apply this to an app? Of course you could apply it to an app, Lewis. You could apply it to anything. There is a way to build a business and get commitment before you build it. And the entrepreneurial market has changed with things like Kickstarter that allow you to sell before you get going. Um, Natalie says, sadly, business grants are offered to limited liability companies, but not sole traders. Natalie, I've just said you don't need any of that stuff. Sell first and you don't need a grant. You don't need a loan. You can operate for profit. That's the key. And I think so many people in business spend their time focusing on how do I get a grant? How do I get a loan? Instead of focusing on how do I make a sale? Sales is the lifeblood of your business. And why don't people like selling? I know we did this last week, but for those of you who weren't here on Monday's course, if I say the word salesman to you, what's the first thing that comes to mind? If I say the word salesman, what's the first thing that comes to mind? And if you were here, maybe you've changed your opinion. Yeah, please write it in the chat on YouTube or on Zoom. Katie and I are here monitoring all your messages. Eddie says cringeworthy. Jack May says fear of rejection. Uh, Louise says cut of the profit. Donna says slimy last week, not anymore. <laughs> which is good, Donna. I love that you've changed your mind. Pushy, hard sell. Uh, there's lots of things. And then we wonder why we don't want to go and do what our business actually needs, which is sell, because we think it's a bad thing. So we need to change our mindset and realize that sales is the process of finding someone with a problem and fixing it. So you are actively making people's lives better when you sell. But people don't do it because they're afraid of rejection. They find it cringeworthy. It's pushy. 
yeah, Catherine says cringe. Karen says annoying. It's all about getting over what we think sales is, developing a new mindset and finding customers. Because without sales, you don't have a business. And one of the best expressions I've ever heard about sales is sales is the transfer of enthusiasm for one person to another. If I can get enthusiastic about what I'm doing and I can, quote unquote, infect you with my enthusiasm, I'm most of the way to making a sale. And it doesn't have to be pressury, slippy, pushy and all of those things. It can be discovering if the person needs what you're doing and if they don't you help them to make a different choice and you find the next customer because if you're only ever understanding your customer and their needs well you're only ever doing good and for me sales is the force that actually does good but i wanted you to really understand this is why people would rather spend time building a website going for a grant getting a loan writing a business plan they will do anything to avoid actually selling. It's amazing. And I see it time and time again. They're like, I just need to perfect my product. I just need to do this. I just need to do this. You don't need to do any of that. We need to skip all of that stuff and stop procrastinating on sales and actually start finding customers we can help, that we can improve their life. And I guess here... What we really need to do is change your mindset about what sales actually is. So come on one of the other sales workshops we're doing. Maybe I'll send you a link afterwards to some of the sales podcasts I've been doing. But the key is sales makes people's lives better. If you can sell someone on a product that will improve their life, they pay you, their life is better. Everyone wins. That's what true sales should all be about. It should all be about helping other people. Uh, Emma Curtis says, I'm doing that now without realizing. Noticed I'm a big procrastinator, not sure why. Procrastination happens because we link more pain to taking the action than we do to not taking the action. So if we think, if we ask for the sale, we might get rejected, that could be incredibly painful. Whereas if we don't ask for the sale, we can just pretend we're working on our business by doing our website or applying for a grant, but we don't have any pain associated to that. Our mammalian monkey brains will always take the option that doesn't lead to pain. So the reason we procrastinate is always because we link pain to taking action and there's not enough pain to not taking action. So let's keep going. We do an entire workshop at the Rebel Business School called Five Ways to Start a Business Without Debt. Uh, go on a Rebel Business School course to get that full thing. I've given you the key one today, but we can't cover all five in like 90 minutes together. Uh, so go on day one of that. This workshop, my mission with you today is to help you come up with an idea to test, have a plan of how to run it and experiment, Leave here knowing what to do next and then make your net first sale within a few weeks. That's all we want to do. And basically, we have to get rid of all of the clutter, any other ideas, and just focus on this. And that's the plan for the workshop. So we're going to do that by looking at side hustle types. So this section is about giving you ideas of what you could test then by the end of the section, we're going to look at which one we can actually pick and test. So side hustle types, you've got freelancing, gig economy, pet sitting, walking, content creation, selling your own products or services or flipping. There's the broad starter to the first six. Let's have a look at them all. And the idea is it's a buffet of ideas. Not all of these ideas are right for you. Lucy is not going to want to do all of these businesses. Neither is Emma nor Daniel. You just need to pick one to have a go with, and then we can go from there. So think of this as the buffet section that you can pick and choose from and choose one that's right for you. So let's go on with freelancing. Freelancing, 
one of the major ways to do it that's been changed recently is you just go through a platform. So you pick a people per hour, a Fiverr or an Upwork, something like that, and you offer your service through that marketplace to buyers. To give you examples, Katie and I have bought lots of stuff through these services. I've bought people who've edited my podcast. I've hired designers that have designed T-shirts for me. Uh, we've had people who've helped us with chart design, spreadsheets. You have skills. You might not realize this, but you do. You have skills that you could offer through this marketplace and sell to people. The other way of doing freelancing is to go directly to a client. So you cut out the platform and you go directly to someone that has a specific need and then you help them for that. The key here, the key concept I really want you to get from this bit is whoever sells it makes most of the money. So if you are going through a platform to the client, basically the platform is actually selling you to the client. So they will take a chunk of your cash from it. If you sell directly, you will always make more money. So whoever actually does the sales is the person who makes the most money. So lots of the time people will complain about the platforms. They take such a big cut. They do this, they do that, but they don't want to do the sales work. If you're happy to actually do the sales and marketing, you will always earn a bigger percentage, a bigger portion of the cash. It will all be yours. When I was running my workshops, I used to do presentation skills workshops. So I teach people how to present and communicate. And if I found the client directly, I would keep all of the money. But sometimes there was intermediaries who sold it and they would charge the client a thousand pounds a day and I would get 400 pounds a day. They kept a huge percentage of the money because they did the sales. That's just how business is. And I really wanted you to understand this principle. Please, can you put like an X in the chat if you get this? If you sell it, you will get more of the money. If someone else sells it for you, you won't get the money. Like you get less of a percentage. So please let me know you understand that by putting an X in the chat. Eddie says X, Ella does perfect. I just wanted to make sure because it's such a key principle that I think people don't get whilst they're doing this. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, Lucy, Polly, Isabel, Alex Payne. Good to see you back. Um, cool. So this particular section is, if you help enough other people get what they want in life, you can have what you want in life. And the bigger the problem that you fix, the more you can charge for it. So for me, it's always been find the biggest problem possible and charge for it. That's what I've always done. So my suggestion to you is ask people what their biggest challenges are. Like ask people, what keeps you awake at night? What stresses you out? What causes you problems? What's the biggest challenge you're focused, uh, facing at the moment in your business? What's the challenge you're facing in life? You might ask people at work. You need to find big, juicy problems that you can tackle and the juicier the problem, the more the ability to make money doing it. You could ask, if there was one thing you could get done quickly, what would it be? Then you're silent and you listen from people. This is how you find the opportunities to sell. What could someone do that would make the biggest impact in your life right now? And you find out what their problems are and then charge it and charge them for it, charge them for solving it. So this is what freelancing is at its essence, is you find a company with a problem, you help them fix it, and you charge them for it. That's freelancing. Find a problem, solve it. That's me with a wrench on the other side. Uh, and the key here is to ask the questions and listen. So if you were wanting to start a job, a freelancing role, the key is to get out there and ask questions and listen. So find out what do people complain about? 
what do people avoid doing? What stresses people out? What takes up most of their time? Find out those different things and then you can sell them that. So that's freelancing. Hopefully that's given you lots of different ideas there. Eddie in the chat says uh, you've got intermittent audio. Can you just confirm whether you can all hear me well or not? Am I cutting out, in or out? Uh, can you hear me okay? Sophia shaking her head. I think that means I'm okay. I can hear you. Oh, you're sat next to me, Katie. Uh, perfect. So, Eddie, unfortunately, I think it's your speakers or the internet. Everyone else is saying loud and clear. Sorry about that. Uh, so maybe just try reloading the page, Eddie. Um, Derek says audio is fine, which is good. Thank you, everyone. So let's get on to gig economy. Gig economy is a huge movement at the moment, and it tends to be run by a few major platforms, such as Uber or Bolt. You can do driving, you can do Uber Eats, you can do Deliveroo, you get on your bike, you deliver food. Amazon Flex is delivering parcels. TaskRabbit is doing different tasks for different people. But there is a huge gig economy movement. Katie did Deliveroo. Uh, she used to love it. Instead of a gym membership, she did Deliveroo and she would cycle people's food to them in the evening. Occasionally, someone would give her a two pound tip, uh, but she made money getting fit, which was fantastic. So like, there are ways to do this instead of going to the gym, do Deliveroo. Um, but the key here is there is a ceiling on your income on these services. There is literally a ceiling because they pay you what they pay you. You can't, unless you put in more hours, you can't earn more. So unless Katie did Deliveroo 24 seven, delivering breakfast, lunch and dinner, like that's the only way to earn more money. So whilst these are great for earning some extra cash, you are blocked from earning more, which kind of comes back to that principle of whoever sells it makes most of the cash. So we're going on to number three, which is pet sitting or walking. This has become a huge thing. People love their pets, sometimes more than their family members. We'll leave that there. Uh, do you have space at home to house pets, to host pets? Do you want to take pets whilst their owners are on holiday? Do you just want to walk with them? This is a fairly easy one to run a mini experiment with and to test. You can definitely earn income doing this way. Uh, Laura, who was on the workshop a couple of weeks ago for Living Large on a Small Budget, she uses this to pet sit in amazing houses around the home world, and she basically gets her accommodation for free as she does it. So this is not only a way to earn more, you might also reduce your expenses as well. We're going to move on quickly from that one to content creation. There is me with a microphone because I've run podcasts, I've built blogs. But content creation is basically building content that people will read, and then you can use that content to sell to people. Uh, types of content, you've got broadly speaking four types. You've got blogging, which is words. If you like writing, this one's good for you. You've got podcasting. You don't like words, you like using your voice, you're good with uh, the words you say, interviewing people, podcasting. You've got YouTube or video, so actual content creation where you have to use your face and your eyebrows and all other elements as you do it. And then the final one is social media. So lots of businesses hire people to create social media content for their businesses. So those are the, broadly speaking, the four types of content that you could create. I wanted to say building a blog is a long term game. It is not a quick way to earn money. You basically have to build the blog, which you can do for free, build up the audience over time and then monetize the blog. So it relies on having an audience or a mailing list of volume to be able to do that. One of the keys with any type of content creation is building up a mailing list. The most valuable asset in any business is your mailing list because that's your customers who will spend money with you. So I don't care what business you're in, please build a mailing list because that's the people you spend money with. You need to own the access to them. Then we've got podcasting. Uh, I love podcasting. It's become a phenomenal wave around the world. 
you can use Spotify for podcasters free to create your podcast. You could probably do it with the microphone on your phone, but if you have one, they're fairly cheap online for like 20 odd quid. Uh, you come up with a subject, you record it, you put it out there, you promote, you build up an audience, and then you can monetize through adverts, through all sorts of different things. And I've got an episode of my podcast for you. That is 11 ways to monetize your content, which I'm going to share with you in a second. But you basically build an audience and then sell them stuff. That's how you make money. This guy uh, is a rather good looking chap. Uh, I don't normally have shirtless people on my slides unless they're me. Uh, this is Andrew Alinda. He came on my podcast. He uh, works in finance in the day and then has a YouTube channel about health and uh, calisthenics. So using training to be healthy. And he built up his YouTube channel as a side hustle and I helped him do it and he actually came on my podcast for a couple of years and you can see his journey from starting his side hustle to making several thousand pounds a month through his YouTube channel. The first episode with him was called 11 ways to monetize your platform so Katie's going to put the link in the chat on both YouTube and Zoom, or you can scan the QR code. That takes you to a podcast I recorded with him all about how to make money out of your content. And that will apply to blogs, podcasts, YouTube, all of it. Then if you want to find this whole series, I did a whole series of workshops. This link is to the Rebel Entrepreneur podcast page. Uh, scroll down and you will see the coaching series and you will find the coaching series with Andrew, and it's all about building your YouTube channel. Katie has something to say. She's coming in from the side. If you're watching on Catch Up, all the links that Alan mentions are in the description of the video. Thank you. She has a lovely calming voice, doesn't she? She's like the, the calming influence from the side. There's me with my crazy energy. Let's do stuff. Then there's lovely Katie. Moving on, uh, other social media. Like we broadly talked about that. I have met a huge number of people. I have a friend called Christina who built a photography business photographing food and drink for brands. So she creates photographs for brands to be able to promote their food and drink. And I don't care what it is, a hotel that wants to get clients to come to it, a restaurant that wants to get clients, they all want to get clients and they have to produce content for their channels. You can charge people to create that content and build it for them. And then if you're really smart, what you would do is measure the impact of your content to show it increases sales for them. Then you can use that data to sell even more. And that's how you build a business. So move on to the next one, which is sell your own services or products. This is probably my favorite version because if you are selling it, you get most of the money, which is always a winner. This is me presenting a workshop. This is basically what I did for nearly my entire business career. I had plenty of other ideas that didn't always work, but selling workshops always worked. The first example for you uh, is a friend called Jamie. This is her, and she was an artist, and she came on my podcast. She messaged and said, I don't know which idea to use. So she came on the podcast Together, we refined which idea she would use, and she actually decided to sell a comic book. But she wanted to draw the comic book before she sold it. What do you think my advice was? Wow, Emma zoomed in on her face then. I don't know if she was looking at the camera or not, but she went, what do you think my thought was? <laughs> what do you think my idea was? Should you write the comic book before you sell it? Sophia's nodding. I was hoping she would shake her head. <laughs> Please put it in the comments. SRF says sell it first. Zoe says sell it first. Jack May says sell it first. I love that. What platform do you think we used? Mark O'Donnell says a very capital. No, do not write it first. Emma says Kickstarter. That's exactly right. We did a Kickstarter. So she drew a few illustrations to show. You can see the type of design. She drew a few illustrations to show her comic book. She put it on Kickstarter and we spent most of our time selling it and promoting it. And she made all of her money before the Kickstarter 
before she even created it. I did the whole thing on a podcast series so you can listen beginning to end about how it works. The podcast with the link here is episode one of her series, which is about picking an idea. So she had many ideas. She didn't know which to start picking an idea. And then the other link is to the Rebel podcast page. If you scroll down to the coaching section, there is a link to her specific podcast series. And you see the character at the top with blood on her hand. The comic book she wrote was about a robot that murdered people. And the most profitable part of the Kickstarter, which is a genius idea, she offered, if you pay X number of dollars uh, and send me a photo, you can be the person who get murdered in the comic book. And it sold out almost instantly. It was a genius idea. Uh, so like, it's worth listening to that series if you like podcasts, because it will give you lots of ideas of how you sell before you create. The other kind of idea is like a food business. We spoke to you last week about Mr. Singh, who came to our house. We bought the ingredients. He turned up, taught us to make them, and then he left. Like, There's no cost to set up a business like this. If you have a family recipe, if you're good at cooking, like a food business is a fantastic idea. Adela says about pricing, we're coming on to that in a minute and I have a few ideas for you. Workshops is a fantastic idea. I don't care what skill you've got, whether you like sailing, fishing, um, it doesn't really matter. You can run a course teaching people to do what you do. And we had one guy that did barefoot uh what's the thing where you go around the coast looking for things like foraging he did barefoot foraging on the coast of scotland and sold it on airbnb i really don't care what skill you've got there is an audience out there that want to do what you do so selling workshops is a fantastic way to do it and the key principle always is Whoever sells it makes most of the money. So if you sell through Airbnb experiences, you will be paying commission. If you find your own customers, you will earn more of the cash. So focus on selling it yourself. Okay, final one, flipping. Uh, flipping is not being rude to people whilst you drive along. It is buying something and selling it. Lots of people flip houses. They buy a house, do it up, and then sell it. That's a very big scale. Big scale, small scales is buying stuff in local stores uh, and then putting it online and selling it. You can buy for cheap and sell for more. Maybe you add value in the middle, but that's what flipping is, is buying for cheap, selling for more. Uh, Laura's example was her brother who finds used Dyson vacuum cleaners in the tip. He's learned how to repair them and then he sells them on eBay as refurbished vacuum cleaners afterwards. It's amazing what you can find and sell. And we had one lady on the Rebel Business School. You can tell why she was one of my favorites. She used to find old Lego minifigures and sell them. So she would go around all the car boot sales, buy Lego minifigures and sell them online. And some of them can be very valuable. So I don't really care what it is. Maybe you've got a passion for a particular thing, but you can buy it, clean it, improve it, or even just flip it and sell it as a way to create an extra income. Um, and we have one final example of this. We had a lady that started a furniture store uh, she would find furniture that people were giving away on Facebook and then she would upcycle it and sell it on for a fantastic price. So there is always a way to create that extra income. So what I'd love to know is, did any of those ideas struck you? Struck you? Strike you. What did you get out of this little section? This was the ideas section. What hit you what did you think what did you get from it and katie has a thought too 
whilst we wait for people to put that in the chat, we've had a few questions coming in in the meantime, which hopefully you can answer. So first of all, Natalie said, we're talking about starting for free and you don't need money to start. She said, I still need a fund to pay someone to build a functional website, including tools such as online marketing, SEO, payment gateway, email marketing. Well, this sounds a lot, doesn't it? Like, no wonder it sounds like you need money for this cybersecurity and analytics for the e-commerce platform. So surely you need money to get a website, don't you? Uh, I love the way you set that up, Katie. The answer is no, you don't need money to create a website. Come on the Rebel Business School. Uh, the wonderful Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead are funding a full Rebel Business School, a two-week course coming up. And it has an entire day on how to build a website with no money. The first website I ever built uh, was completely for free online online. Uh, the Rebel Business School teach Canva or Wix. There is a way to build a website for free. And we've built several for businesses that have created incomes over £100,000 from a free website. Uh, so you don't need any of that. We just need to get a simple one page website up and do it, which we're coming to. Have we got time for a few other questions? Yes. Lewis asked about how it works with designing an app when you've got you know, you don't start with any money, sell first before you create. How do you do that with an app specifically? Like, how would you go about doing that? Well, Lewis, I think it depends exactly on what you're creating. Um, probably I would partner with someone who has an audience that would want your app. Like, we need to find someone who would actually pay for it. Then I would create some kind of demo to show, some kind of visuals to show what the app will do, what it will work at. Uh, and then with my partner, I would see if we can test the market and get people interested. Either signing up to a, I'm interested, tell me when it's available, or like I'm actually going to buy it preferably and getting some of the money in to deliver it and doing almost a Kickstarter on the app. That would be how I would do it. And we're going to come on to more of that soon. Katie. Another question we had about mailing lists. So you talk about the importance of getting them away from the social media platform. So you might have loads of followers on Instagram or YouTube or wherever, but you don't kind of own that list. So someone asked, it was Sophia, how... Can I ask about mailing lists? Could you go a little bit more into that, how it works? How would you go about doing that? So for me, it's a simplest possible version. Uh, MailChimp, I think, has up to a thousand people for free to start with and is GDPR compliant because we all love that uh, piece of legislation as business people. Um, so getting a simple one that has a free initial thing, capturing people through a form and getting their email addresses so you can market to them directly. If you were selling face to face, it might be as simple as a clipboard with an email address and a name to start with that you put into MailChimp yourself. Um, doesn't really matter which piece of software you use. Look up free mailing list providers and have a look at that to start with. Uh, Sophia says, can I come and join you guys on the Rebel School, please? Yes, you can. Definitely. The Rebel School is free and will always be free for everyone. I'll give you a link to it in a little bit. Emma says MailChimp is good. There have been a lot of co comments. I will catch up with them all as I'm going. But we're going to move on to the next little section to make sure we keep going with this. And this is coming up with ideas. So how do we refine and come up with more ideas? I have a little challenge for you. If you still don't know what to do, my challenge for you is to collect 10 ideas a day. You may be going 10 business ideas a day. 10? How do I do that? Well, there are so many ways to collect business ideas, and I'm going to give you a few. The way to come up with a good idea is to come up with as many ideas as possible. Because five out of six of your ideas won't be very good. Believe me, I've tested a lot of them. Uh, but one of them will be genius. So you need to collect all of the ideas and then we can judge them afterwards. So ways to do that is to think, what do I spend money on? There's a business idea in that. What do your friends spend money on? There's definitely a business idea on that. What did your business spend money on? There's lots of ideas in that. What do you love to do? What do you enjoy doing as kids? What problems could you fix for people? What do other people say you're good at? 
like every day thinking about how could I make money doing that? What could I do here? And asking yourself questions. That's the key. Questions are the answer for this section. What would you do in your spare time? And what we want to do is not get stuck in the loop. And this happens to so many people. Here's the loop. They come up with an idea. And they go, yeah, I've got an idea. Oh, yeah, but that won't work because. And they have like a negative judgment about it immediately. Then they come up with another idea and they go, I've got an idea. It's great. Oh, yeah, but I don't think I've got the skills for that. Then they have another idea and they go, great, I'll go and tell my friends. And my friends say it won't work. And then in this endless loop of idea and doubt that kills their progress. What I want to say to you is we have to exit the loop and let the market decide. We have to exit the loop and let the market decide. And this is the key concept. The market needs to decide whether your business idea is good or not. Not me, not your partner, not your friends, not anyone else, the market. And what I mean by that is at the end of Rebel Business School, people always used to come to me and say, Alan, do you think my business idea will be successful or not? And I'm like, can I answer that question? Like, do I look into my crystal ball and go, yes, I think your business will be successful? I don't know. The only people that know is the market and will they buy from you? And I always say to them, I can't tell you if your business will be successful or not. There's only one question I can answer with certainty. And that is, would Alan buy your product or service? And I'm only one customer and one type of customer. So you need to go out there and ask the market. Let the market judge your ideas, not you. Does that make sense to you? Like, Stop judging your own ideas. Let the market judge your ideas. What's the quickest way to come up with an idea? Come up with hundreds. Most of them will be terrible. Then we can pick the one we want to test. But so many people kill their ideas before they even get out there. How do you kill ideas? Let's imagine I've got an idea for a new business. Uh, what's my business going to be? I am going to do uh, food tours uh, of Mexican churches. Do you like my business idea? They don't have food in churches, Alan. That's silly. <laughs> Katie is good at killing ideas. Thanks. How would you kill my idea? What would you say? And I'm sure you're all quite practised at killing your own ideas. Um, yeah, Emma says we have so many ideas, but don't actually write it down. And then it's forgotten. That is one way to kill an idea is just to say it, but then forget about it. You don't write it down. You don't take action about it. How do you kill ideas? People say, oh, that won't work. This won't work. People won't ever buy from that. Oh, I already know someone who did that. Um, Alexandra says there's Mercato Mayfair in London, which is a food market in a church. Stop being positive, Alexandra. <laughs> That's not the point of the exercise. <laughs> uh, what we're suggesting is just stop killing your ideas and let's get them out into the world and let's ask the market if they're flourished. And it is OK to copy other people. It is OK to copy. This is not fourth grade maths. You can copy someone else's business. Now, lots of people say, oh, I just can't come up with an innovative or a new idea. And they have this thing that it has to be unique. I have to have a unique idea. And like, well, it's not unique to run a cleaning business. Well, I don't really care if it's unique. Do you enjoy cleaning and can you make money doing it? Yes. So it doesn't really matter. Whatever the business is, doesn't have to be unique. If someone else is running a business like that, it means they're making money. You could make money doing it as well. So have a look at what out is out there and borrow the idea with pride which is, comes back to running a mini experiment. So we're going to focus on this little bit, mini experiments. And the idea here is taking a chance on your ideas. We kind of almost want to roll the dice on your ideas and test it to see if someone buys. So the aim of this is to get you customers. So you choose one idea. Don't care which it is. Doesn't really matter. 
You build a free website page on Wix or whatever it is. Then you put it in front of an audience and you ask the audience to buy. If they buy, you have a business. If they don't, we have learning and we can work out what to do next. So that's the kind of process. But I wanted to skip out of the presentation here and do some live examples. I want to actually know what business ideas you've got that you've been stuck on starting. And I would like to give you ideas of how to start them. So in the chat right now, please write your business ideas. Uh, that you think, oh, I don't know how to start my food delivery business, my restaurant, my whatever it is. I don't know how to start whatever it is. Stick it in the chat and we'll see if we can come up with ideas together of how to start it. Because uh, this is the interesting bit. We actually need to get going and help you to actually start making monies. Because that was the promise of the workshop is you can leave here with a plan. Uh, so... Ernestina says flipping. Uh, it depends what you want to flip. Um, but the simple thing is to find an audience who wants something. And then once you've found the audience who wants something, then we can go out and find what they want and sell it to them. So for us, we start slightly backwards. Most people start with the product and then go, who do I sell this to? For me, it's always been, who's my audience and what do they want? And once I can start to understand what they want, then I can sell to them. But always start with who's your audience and what do they want? Uh, we've got designer pre-owned bags. That's says, what Ernestina is flipping. Aha. Uh -huh. And Mark O'Donnell is flipping action figures, which I love. Um, designing Designer pre-owned bags. Like start with the audience and find out what they want then we need to find the location of where to buy them for less and maybe we can find them online maybe we can find them in different charity shops but we uncover the treasures that then we take to our audience and that's the basis of it um the next one katie what was this next one here uh, mo connell on youtube says song lyric writing I love it. Song lyric writing. Mo Connell, we've actually hired someone to write song lyrics and we did it on People Per Hour, Fiverr, and I know it's on Upwork as well. So I would create an advert on those services uh, and then I would promote it everywhere. Hopefully you've got a little bit of experience on songwriting and you can deliver on that, but it's all about putting out there and selling it. That's the key bit. Charlotte Sims says writing a book would be interested to know how I sell it before writing it. Charlotte, we actually worked with someone. I had someone on the podcast recently who wanted to do that. And she decided to do a Kickstarter where people would get the book chapter by chapter. They'd get a chapter a week as they went and they prepaid for the book. She would write it and then she sold it before she wrote it and delivered it by chapter by chapter. So that's one way of doing it. There's lots of different ways to do it. Um, but what you really need to do is find a package that people will pay for and want. The lady with the chapter a week also included a discussion with the was it a chapter a week or a chapter a month. Might have been a month. doesn't matter what the time period is. She included a discussion with the author each month. So people would get the chapter before the next chapter came out, they could discuss it with the author and it sold really well. She got all the money first. Is this an episode that has been published? I'm looking for the link on the podcast. I think so. Okay. I've done 250 <laughs> episodes of the podcast now and it's not easy to know where they all are. Um, okay. Lazy gardening hacks. Ella says lazy gardening hacks. Ella, what does that mean? I'm not quite sure. Is it like hacks on how to do gardening lazy or something else? Uh, Isabel wants to link up small artisan British companies who make homeware and lifestyle goods that are eco-conscious, made by people, not machines, selling their products, but also serving to promote them. Isabel, those companies will want sales. So if you can find the customers and take a cut out of selling it, because whoever sells it makes most of the money. 
Like if you can sell their stuff, they will give you a lower price for buying it. You can sell their stuff and you can generate the marketplace that does those customers. All of it starts with sales on those ones. Uh, Rachel says financial well-being workshops in businesses. We just need an outline. And then we can go to businesses and ask them about the financial well-being of their employees. We can uncover their pain points. Do their employees come to them to borrow money at the end of the month? Do they come to them with problems? Uncover the pain points, sell them something to fix it. And that's it. And if you want help writing a financial well-being workshop, uh, ChatGBT is actually fantastic for creating outlines. Just literally go to it and type in, can you help me write an outline for a financial well-being workshop? And it will give you lots of ideas that you can refine and sell. It's a really easy way to do it. Uh, Adele says, I'd love to start a career coaching businesses where I focus on 18 to 24 year olds. I meet loads of them at work and have no idea about corporate life, uh, but there are already so many coaches. Adele, there are lots of coaches. There really are. Um, I want to give you one key principle to all of you. And this comes from my most painful year in business. My worst year in business where I made the least possible money was my second year ever in business. I'd run this fantastic entrepreneurial program for three schools, a pupil referral unit, a special education school and a mainstream school. It was a nine month program. I loved it. Then I spent the entire next year trying to sell to schools. What's one thing schools don't have a lot of? Money. They just don't have much money. And I was trying to sell to an audience that didn't have the money to be able to afford me. So I love that you want to sell to 18 to 24 year olds. They're probably a bracket with less money. The key is when you start your business, sell to people who have money, as much money as possible, because then it's really easy selling coaching to someone that thinks a thousand pounds is not a lot is a lot easier than selling to an 18 year old who's never seen a thousand pounds in one place. So focus on selling to the people with the money. That is the absolute key to getting going. Then you can give it away to the 18 to 24 year olds. Once you've made a shed load of cash for yourself, that's absolutely the key. Katie. Or you could sell it to the employers of the 18 to 24 year olds, because I'm sure they would like them to be more effective at work. And that is a fantastic idea as well. And I sold lots of time management courses when I was getting going to employees to help their employees be more efficient. Uh, Daniel says, I'd like to own a campsite, but not sure how to sell that first Many ways. One, Daniel, do you have to own the land? Or could you find someone that already owns the land and then you fill it with a camping for a several weeks in the summer as an experiment? So you do a deal with the owner of the land. Uh, you'll pay them half of everything you earn by doing the rent or whatever it is. Then you put it on Airbnb, you put it in different places, you sell it, you fill up your week with people and you earn money from doing a week or two weeks camping as the summer as a mini experiment. If it goes well, you make money and then you can save up to buy your own land. And that's a key principle. I don't care whether you want to borrow, start a restaurant, uh, an escape room, like borrow the space first. Don't buy it yourself. Then you can just sell someone else's space. And that's the reason I started my business before it was called Rebel Business School was called Pop Up Business School, because basically we never paid for a venue. We just popped up in shopping centers, community centers that we could borrow to run the courses. I don't want to own property. Um, I just want to use everyone else's. Katie, uh, Jackie says, Sand fit, indoor sand dunes. Fill a warehouse with sand and get people to run around and do exercises knee deep in sand. You would get fit doing that. We've been running on the beach in Mexico and it destroys my legs in about 10 minutes. I would start, like, can you find somewhere with sand nearby? Can you find these things? I think the key concept here, if I could take up from where we're going, is... 
every entrepreneur I've ever wanted to work with starts with the dream version of what they want. So for Daniel, he wants the campsite and he can imagine his own campsite and the buildings and the space and he owns the land. For Jackie, she can imagine them a warehouse with the sand. They always start with the dream version. And from that dream version, what I want to say to you is what's the smallest possible test that we can do now to see if you actually like doing it? Because Daniel, I assume you haven't run a campsite before. Maybe you have. He's shaking his head. But let's test it first. See if we like it by doing it in someone else's space and then go from there. And I'm going to come on to examples from that. Sophia has raised her hand. Uh, Sophia, are you going to come on camera and actually ask me a question? Just to know you will be on YouTube forevermore if you do that. Just Yes, you. you have a warning. You will be on YouTube um, God, and I got up at 4.30 this morning to do my accountability session. I'm in my pyjamas right now, but that's how serious I am. But I don't really want to do that, but we're doing it. Who cares? <laughs> so uh, ask me your question, and then we're going to go back to the presentation and what we're doing. Tell me. It's lovely to see you here. Thank you. So I've been following you guys for a few weeks, and I'm an ex-NHS nurse, and I, I am working on setting up a project to deliver to solicitors and barristers mm -hmm. who need medical legal nurses to provide them with expert nursing opinions and so that it will help their patient's journey because these solicitors want to win their cases for their patients and they need nursing experts to provide an expert opinion so that it's fair when it goes to the court. And um, and so my question is, earlier on in this session, you mentioned about the male chimp thing. And I don't really get like what you mean. And I'm trying to figure out how I can implement this male chimp thing. Like, I don't have anything. So if I was to email a bunch of solicitors now, I other than telling them what I do and how I can help them, and then trying to get them to come my way so I can tell them my fees. I don't have anything else. I feel like I'm meant to have something set up, like some marketing, like a book, like a CV. I don't know. Uh, Sophia, you don't need MailChimp for what you're planning on doing. So that's the easy answer. If I were you, I would have a very simple one-page website that says, I provide these services for solicitors, I'm a qualified nurse. I've worked for years in the NHS. You look quite young, so I don't know how many years, but like I've worked for this period. I know what I'm doing. Then I would use LinkedIn to find all of the solicitors in my area. And I would just contact them directly and say, this is what I do. Do you ever have need for this service? And then I would ring them afterwards and go, did you get my email? What do you think? And that's it. And I would have an Excel spreadsheet with a list of the solicitors I'm contacting, whether they've responded, and then I would follow them up. So it's a very simple sales process uh, that you can go through. But it's basically solicitor firm, name, have they responded or not, an email address. And then I would just follow them up once a week until you actually get a response out of them. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, but the whole MailChimp thing, I've heard people talk about this for a while and the idea of like cold emailing sounds great, but I feel like if I'm going to do that as one channel, one strategy for marketing, like is there anything specific I could create like on Canva or whatever, which will help me to send this documents to these guys or or is it these guys don't want this thing and I'm just making it more complicated than it needs to be and I just need to follow what you said? Solicitors, this is going to be a gross generalisation, but I'm going to go for it. Please do not crucify me, YouTube. <laughs> Solicitors are fairly old school and they just would be quite happy with a text thing or connecting with them in different ways, sending them the pitch and seeing if they actually want them uh, and then going from there. So just keep it simple. And I think so often... And this is for everyone listening to this. Us business owners are like, I need a professionally designed this. I need this. I need this. They won't take me seriously unless I have a limited company and I have this and I have, you don't need any of that. 
that's for you to feel confident. So I would skip it all and just feel confident that you can deliver value for these people. Find out what their problems are. I even ring them up and say, like, I'm just starting my business. I would love to chat to you about the biggest problems you face. And if I can help you, I'm a registered nurse. I help with this and this. Maybe I can help you. Tell me about your biggest problem cases and what I could do to support you. And then you'll find one solicitor that says, yes, I have this client and they're <laughs> this problem. And then yeah. once you've found that, you can go and find every other solicitor that has that type of client. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. 100%. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for joining us in your pajamas and coming on live. You don't <laughs> need any of that stuff. Just go straight to them, connect and sell. It will make a huge difference. Okay. That's what I'm going to work on when I wake up at 4.30 in the morning. I'm going to work on that. Because you've given me a clear template now. I overthink small things and create them to larger, which then means I gatekeep myself from moving forward with the plan that I create in my head. So thank you. Sophia, you are not alone. So have I in the past. So has everyone on this call. We all do it. We just got to break it down to the simplest possible version. So good luck. And please let me know how you get on. I will, definitely. I'm going to find your group on Facebook at some point. Perfect. Thanks, Sophia. See you soon. Thank you. Okay. Right, everyone, we are back on with the presentation. We're done for the live examples at the moment because I've got more stuff to give you. Uh, the keys to starting a business. Uh, it's one of my favorite slides with a giant gold key. First concept is doesn't really matter which business idea you pick. For the overthinkers in the audience, there is no right answer. Stop overthinking it. We just need to pick an idea and let the market decide. The key here is you don't know which business is going to be the most successful until you just put it out there and try it. So let me give you a, an idea. Imagine there are two large hills or mountains in front of you, and the two hills or mountains represent two business ideas that you are going to start. What most people do is they sit in between the two mountains and try and analyze them. And they like make notes, which one's gonna make the most profit? How am I gonna do this? How far is it to go? Do I need a website? Do I need MailChimp to do this? Like they'll analyze which mountain they're gonna run up. They sit there for possibly years trying to work out which one to do. My theory is, doesn't really matter, just start running up a mountain. And you will soon know whether it's the right mountain for you. You'll get halfway up, no one will have bought, and you go, oh, didn't work. You'll run back down and then you'll run up the other one. And here's the thing, by me just starting, I will have run up both mountains by the time you've even evaluated which one you want to do. The action is how you know. The learn You cannot tell which mountain is the right one for you to climb until you start it. So the only way you can know is by taking action. Just charge up a mountain and find out which one is right as you, which is the idea of running a mini experiment, is just give it a go. The next concept in getting starting is lots of times people say, oh, it just doesn't excite me. Just doesn't excite me. Not really excited. Don't really like that one not excited. And I get really frustrated with that because it's not the thing's job to excite you. It's your job to excite yourself. Get excited. Find what excites you about the opportunity. Find your energy. It's within you. It's not the thing's job to excite you. It's your job to excite yourself. So jump up, work out why you're doing it, and fly at it. It makes such a difference. You just need to develop an offer and put it out there for people. So let's look at what do you actually need for an offer. So we had Sophia come on the chat a minute ago. What does she actually need to sell to solicitors? What do you need to be able to do your first ever offer? 
And Sarah in the chat says, I think I think I'm an overthinker, which is a fantastic sentence to start with. I think I'm an overthinker. Uh, I think I am. Let me think about that. Yep, I definitely am. Procrastinating and overthinking are my kryptonites. Sarah, remove the overthinking. This is what you need. This is the minimum you need to be able to start. So developing an offer, what we want is the like minimum viable thing you can do to sell it. This is time trap escape rooms. They're one of my favorite examples, a lovely couple called Katie and Andrew. They wanted to start an escape room. They actually did it by starting a pop-up escape room where they borrowed the room and did it in someone else's building. Their entire story is on this link, which is the link to my podcast on Spotify. Listen to that, because if you're thinking, well, I need a business, I need a building for my restaurant i need a building for this i need a warehouse for my sand for people to climb up and down if that's what you're thinking listen to this episode hopefully that will unlock you you don't need a building we just need a space to run it we're coming up with the simplest possible version of what you do so what does the customer really need so what do people really need to know to buy from you it's fairly simple they need to know the item the thing or the service the description. So we need a description. Then we need to know how it makes their life better, which is what's called the benefits. So you've got your description. We have a, a warehouse, we train in sand, we run up and down. That's the description. But the benefits is you will get strong fast. It's an incredibly efficient workout. It'll improve your health. You'll put on muscle mass and you will live longer. That's the benefits. So they're different to the description. So for Sophia, she would have the description is, I do expert witnessing for solicitors firms. The benefit is I can help your clients to feel more confident. I can reduce your bills. I can help you in court to get your cases through quicker. It's different to the description. So we've got description, benefits, and then price, which we'll come on to in a minute. But people need to know how much it is. What's the price? And then when they can get it, the delivery. Because a lot of what we're talking about here is selling before you create. So you want to be clear, you pay now, I will deliver at this point. Uh, and I found ChatGBT or AI to be an incredible tool to help you do this. Just like go in there and go, write me a description for this project. Uh, write me an SEO optimized outline for what I'm saying, and it will create it for you. You need to edit it, uh, but it is an incredible way to get your first draft done quickly. Katie and I have used this to develop workshops, outlines, all sorts. It's a phenomenal tool, a phenomenal tool. Uh, Emma says, at what point is it best to talk on price? Let me come on to that, Emma, but I do have an answer for you. Uh, and we're actually going to talk about pricing right now. So it's the perfect setup. Number one is we need to work out the cost. So, so many people don't actually understand what it costs to provide a service. So you need to work out, like, if I'm providing this service, what am I actually providing? Either material costs, travel costs, all of these different items. What are my actual costs? And then above that, what do I actually want to make? What profit? And those are the key bits. So many entrepreneurs don't have a clue about how much it actually costs them. So we need to be really clear. What's the heat, light, power, utilities, all those different elements? What are we actually costing us? And then what's the profit on top? My next check is what is the market charging? So what are your competitors charging? You definitely don't want to be the cheapest and you want to find out what else is out there in the marketplace. And quite often there is such a wide variety of prices. You get more confident by looking in the marketplace and going, wow, people are paying that for this. And it gives you more confidence. And then we can't teach all of pricing in one 90-minute workshop on side hustles. So we have an entire Rebel Business School available for you. The incredible Saloni at the Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead is putting on a full 
business school in the area for you. If you're from Royal Borough of Windsor Maidenhead, please use that QR code to be able to sign up now. If you're from the rest of the world, uh, which is not Windsor and Maidenhead, then please use the other QR code. It's for residents, but Saloni is incredible. She's said that anyone can come on it. We just have to make sure we find local people, but anyone is allowed on the workshop. So please, if you live in the area of RBWM, please, can you share this with people? Uh, it's completely free. The entire two week course is completely free. It's funded by the council for you. Uh, it has five ways to build a business for free, sales, how to build a website for free, how to market on social media, tax and accounting. Like, there's a lot you need to know to actually run a business that I can't deliver tonight, but I can get you enough to get going and run your first mini experiment. But there you have the entire workshop for free for you. So please, like, if you're in the area, Royal Borough of Windsor Maidenhead, sign up through that first link. Uh, it would make my day that you're coming along to that course. Uh, and then you've got the rest of the world link there as well. Um, yeah, if you're in the chat, uh, write Lego, send me a message, put a word in the chat that let me know you're still here. I always like to hear, see your comments because it lets me know that you're still here. Um, Sophia says, cheeky, I know, but got to ask, will there be any one-to-one -one mentoring sessions with the above programs? Uh, there are the coaches and the people that run the course, and you can ask them questions throughout. So there's not specific, like, I sign up to the one-to-one -one mentoring thing, uh, but you can get them whilst they're there and work with them. And then there is this thing called Rebel Plus, which is the support services afterwards, which does have one-to-one -one sessions and mentoring and all of that stuff. So that's fantastic. Uh, thank you for messaging us in the chat. It helps as well. Charlotte says, the business school looks amazing, but it's tricky taking that time off work. Do you run evening business schools? Uh, the best thing to do is to go to the podcast episodes, which have different bits of the content in there. They're not doing evening ones at the moment. Mia says, I wish I was closer. It'll be online. So you can sign up, Mia. You can still come along, which is fantastic. Catherine says, will it run again this year? Catherine, if you go to the Rebel Business School uh, forward slash events, the Rebel School forward slash events, I'll say it one more time, therebelschool.com forward slash events, which Katie's putting in the chat. It lists all of our events around the country. So there are some in Kent, Ireland, Wales, England, Scotland. Uh, they're even in Spanish in Mexico and Colombia now. So you can find us all over the world. And there are other events as well. Donna says, I'm still here. Sorry, I was signing up for the business school. Donna, that made my day. Thank you for signing up for that. Uh, perfect. And Verinda says, I love it. You're selling the course before doing it. <laughs> exactly. We have to fill it out, sell it before we do it. And that's actually the first ever Rebel Business School. Do you think I wrote the entire course before I sold it? Daniel turned his head sideways. Emma's wondering whether I did or not. No, I sold it first. Once I'd sold it, then I wrote the course. If it was up to my business partner, Simon, it would have been done the night before. I at least wrote it a month before we did it. But I would never write a course until I've sold it. Jack says no. Yes, Jack, you know me. OK, number seven is taking action. All of this talk is great, but we have to actually do something. So Sophia has to send emails and get on the phone at 4 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, or you can <laughs> wait till 8. Um, here's the key bit undertaking action is discovering your why and the expression that really drives me is if you have a big enough why any how is possible so if you have a reason that is so strong you will go through every rejection every no Every frustration building a website, if your reason is so strong, you will go through all of that, you will be successful. If you have a weak why, like, oh, I fancy running a business, you will never get through the toughness of starting it to be able to actually do it. 
you need a huge why. And it doesn't really matter what it is. Your why can be because I want to afford to go on holiday, because I want to look after my kids, because I want to change the world, leave my legacy, because I want to earn more money. It doesn't really matter. But you need a list of reasons why you're doing this and then connect with that. And that why will drive you. Because if you have a good reason, you will go through anything. So I want to know, why are you doing this? Why are you starting a side hustle? Why are you starting a business? What is your raison d'etre? What is your reason for being? What is your reason for doing this? Because if you don't have a strong why, it's not, it's going to be ups and downs. You're going to be rejected. It's going to be tough. Things are going to happen. If you don't have a strong enough why, you will never go through the difficulty of starting a business. You'll never go through it. So why? Why are you doing this? If you can uncover your why, you will be able to drive through any of the problems that face you. We need a clear objective. You know this. Without a clear objective, we'll never get anywhere. And to give you an example, something you might say to yourself is, I have the simplest possible version of my product or service available for sale on a website by Thursday, the 5th of March. That is a super clear objective. Then we know I need to know what my price is, my description, my benefits. I'll put it on a simple website and then I'll start selling it. But have a super simple objective that you will aim towards. And behind that is the really simple plan. What's my price? What's my website on? What am I promoting and how do I promote it? Facebook, Messenger, email, ringing people, the LinkedIn strategy. There's an episode on my podcast about the LinkedIn strategy, which if you're selling business to business, please listen to the LinkedIn strategy episode. I, people have used that and created incredible businesses. And then we're going to evaluate afterwards. Sophia says, uh, my res reason is because we need to continue to infuse a sense of happiness, justice and empowerment into patients who have been on the poor end of potential practice in nursing care. That is fantastic. Uh, Rachel says, just adopted two boys and on, on adoption leave from stressful job. Uh, I need to put the kids first. It's fantastic. That's a great reason to do this. Like having those reasons why will drive you. And then we take 15 minutes action every single day, preferably before you do anything else. Like start with, I, th I'm i building this business, this side hustle for me. So I'm going to start with it. I'm going to start with me and take 15 minutes action every day. What I and Katie have found is if we start with 15 minutes action, we normally end up doing at least half an hour, maybe an hour. But we always say like we have permission to stop after 15 minutes if we want to. Katie's holding up three fingers like three hours. Um, that's the key bit. Sarah says, so you make your website, then how do you ensure people find your website when it's published? Sarah, the biggest myth in business is if you build it, they will come. Uh, popularized by Fields of Gold, Credible movie in Hollywood and by Wayne's World. If you build it, they will come. It's the biggest lie out there. If you build it, no one will come until you promote it. So you have to promote and publicize and do everything to get your website out there and put it in front of the audience. Yeah, Gareth corrected me Field of Dreams. I said the wrong thing. I said Field of Golds. I was so close. Uh, but you have to promote it. So how do you do that? You send it to your target market. You post it in Facebook. You email it to people. You put it in front of people with flyers. You go to their houses. You have to put it out there. It's up to you. If you build it, no one will come until you promote it. Okay, we're going on to section eight, which is evaluating the mini experiment evaluating the mini experiment, because what gets measured gets improved. 
So I've always had this thing that when you run a mini experiment, there's three areas you want to evaluate afterwards. The first is, did you sell anything? Because that's kind of critical. What were your sales? What was your profit? Did you sell anything? So we want to know from your mini experiment what sales came in. The second bit is, did your customers enjoy it? So they bought it, but would they buy again? Did they enjoy your product or service? Like what specifically did they feel about your service? Because if they bought it, but they hated it and they would never buy from you again, we might not have that business idea. So number one, did you sell anything? Number two, did your customers enjoy it? And number three, did you enjoy it? Did you have fun delivering the business, running the stuff? Did you enjoy doing the business? That's what we need to understand if we're going to continue on with your business after your first mini experiment. So here's the kind of numbers I would check. I would go, okay, so I created my offer. How many people did I present my offer to? Like, did I get it in front? Did I email a thousand people? Did I ring a thousand people? Did I put it online? Did my offer get out to a sufficiently large number of people that I have actually tested the market? Because so many people come to me and say, well, I tried to sell it and I didn't get any orders. And my question is always like, how many people did you try and sell it to? And they're like, well, I posted it on Facebook and you're like, well, one person may have seen it. Is that really selling it? So you need to track how many people did I present my offer to? How many people did I actually put it in front of? The second question is, from those people I put it in front of, how many people showed interest? Did they give me an email address? Did they give it a like? Did they reply? Did I message them? How many people showed interest? Then the key number how many people bought? So I put it in front of a thousand people. Ten people showed interest. Five people bought. Like, what are those numbers and how did you look at? Because that, if you don't know that, you're going to really struggle. And then the final bit is, did you make any money? What was the profit? Because the numbers are what you really, really need to understand for your business. Because that's the first thing I'm going to diagnose when I look at your mini experiment. If you run in a mini experiment, let's imagine uh, Sophia runs her mini experiment. She comes back to me in three weeks time and says, Alan, I ran my mini experiment. Uh, it didn't work. I'm going to say to her, how many solicitors did you contact? That's my first question. Hopefully she can ask answer it and say, I contacted 82 solicitors. Say, great. How did you contact them? Was it by email or phone? And she'll say, well, I put it in a Facebook group of them. And go, well, that's not going to work. Let's ring them. Then from the people you ring, how many did you get through to? And how many people did you make an offer to? That's how I can diagnose where the mini experiment went wrong or right is by understanding those numbers. So I'd really... In this section, my challenge to you is track what you are doing. How many people are you ringing, posting to, sending direct messages to? How are you actually doing this? And on the full Rebel Business School, there is an entire marketing and sales workshop. But this should give you enough to get going. My plan was by the end of this session, you are unlocked to get going. How do you find out if it works? interview your customers. So if anyone actually bought from you, ring them up and find out what they say about what you do. My expression always is, you can't hurt my feelings. Please tell me exactly what happened. Because British people are very concerned about hurting other people's feelings. So they won't tell you what actually happened unless you give them permission. So I always say, you can't hurt my feelings. Please just tell me exactly what happened. Did you actually use the product or services you bought? If you did use them, what did you love about them? What didn't you enjoy about them? 
And actually, if you're only going to ask one question, it would be the next one. What advice would you give me for version two of this product or service? Because we almost want to like forget version one and go, how would I make version two better? So what advice would you give me to improving version two of this? That's the data that's going to help you with your second mini experiment. It's going to change everything. The, did you enjoy a bit? I have a couple of thoughts. Number one is you're never going to like every element of running a business. You have to manage the books, do the finances, create the sales. You're never going to enjoy it all. To a certain extent, you have to get over it and just do it to start with. You have to do everything when you start. And people will go, well, I can just hire people. Well, yes, you can, but not immediately. You need to earn some money first, then you can hire people. And you can grow it and outsource the finances if you didn't enjoy it. You can outsource that as you go. The bit I would really challenge you not to outsource straight away is sales. The person who starts the business is always the best salesperson if they learn how to sell. So get into the sales and learn how to do it. It'll change everything for you. And the better you get at sales, the more money you will make. And one piece here. I would never outsource just because you can't be asked to do it. Don't do that. Learn how to do it yourself, because in the fact of learning how to do it yourself, when you do outsource it, you will be able to understand what the person's actually doing for you. So many business owners I've met have no idea how finances work and they just try and outsource it. And then they wonder why their business is struggling financially in the future like understand the finances and the sales first. Uh, and then you can measure your enjoyment of the different areas of the business. And then you can choose later on if you want to outsource or continue going. Now, how do you know if you should continue? Well, it's simple. Did you make money? Can you see the opportunity? Even if you didn't make money the first time, can you see the opportunity to make money in the future, the green shoots? Did the customers enjoy it? Would they buy it again? And did you enjoy it? Like if you made money, your customer enjoyed it and you enjoyed it, then that sounds like an incredible business. Go and sell it to more people. Get out there and sell it to everyone. So that's how you know if you should keep going or not on mini experiment version two. So version two, now you get to refine. You can refine the offer, the marketing. You can enhance the product. You can tweak the price, hopefully upwards to make it a little bit more. And you can get out there and you run version two and you see where it goes. If it didn't work, then just test a different business idea. My first businesses were not very successful. And if you speak to successful entrepreneurs out there, nearly all of the side hustles and businesses they ran at the start didn't go very far. So test ideas quickly. The average person fails five to 10 times before they get to their best idea. So you might as well fail quickly and fail without spending money. And I have this expression that we have at Rebel Business School, and actually we use in our life, is if you're going to fail, fail fast and fail cheap. Don't spend a long time over failure and don't spend a lot of money on the failure. Get it done quickly and then just move on straight away. So don't spend money setting up the business. Just put it out to the marketplace, see if they buy it. And if it goes wrong, you've not really lost a lot, but you've learned a lot and you can get there quickly. One of my favorite expressions is the extraordinary belongs to those that create it. No one is going to build your business for you. No one's going to start your business, create the life you want. You have to. And if you want to build something, it's up to you. The cheesy expression that I'm going to say on this workshop is, I repeat to myself, if it's to be, it's up to me. Yes, it's cheesy. Lucy's pulling a face at how cheesy it is. If it's to be, it's up to me. You have to take ownership. No one else is going to create your dreams for you. You've got to build them. So please take these ideas and build it. 
Now, before I wrap up and give you my closing message, please will you fill out this poll? This is the only thing we need for the Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead to prove that this course works. So if you're still here, Sophia, if you're still awake and in your pyjamas, please fill this out right now. I feel confident in starting my side hustle. So before the Donegans or before Rebel Business School, how confident did you feel starting a side hustle to make money? And then after the Rebel Business School, the Donegans, how confident do you feel using a side hustle to make extra money? Uh, my hope is we've broken it down and made it a little bit simpler for you to be able to actually get going. Uh, please, please, please fill out this on the Google form. If you're watching in YouTube, that means you too. If you're watching on Catch Up, please fill out this. This is what we need to be able to get the funding to run these workshops. Without the answer to this question, uh, we can't continue to get funding to be able to run these workshops. So I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I would really love it. Like, yeah, before and afterwards us. 84% of people on Zoom have filled it in. Uh, Ella says done. Catherine Lunagate says done. Or she gave us a cheese, which I think means done. Morag said done. Julia, Gareth, Alex. Alex, thank you for doing it. Gareth Wall, thank you for doing it. I really appreciate it. Uh, we can't get funding to run the workshops unless you tell us how it was afterwards. So I really appreciate that. If you haven't answered the poll, please fill it out now. Okay, so come to a Rebel pop-up event. Come along to one of those. Those are the big two-week workshops we run to help people start businesses. They are free and they always will be free. One of the things I wanted when I first set this up was that the workshops will be free for the people who need it the most. So we get incredible sponsors like the Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead who pay for the course and then they give it away to you. So it will always be free. Come along to one of our events, come and get involved on that. Uh, this is the sign up link to the one in Windsor and Maidenhead or the general list. So please have a look at those. You can get the link there, come along to one of those. And then my final bit on this is I do a podcast called The Rebel Entrepreneur, which is all about how to build businesses for free. So if you are out dog walking, Emma, listen to the podcast as you go. Uh, make Daniel listen to it. Listen to the podcast episodes. There are some on building YouTube channels. There are some on building practical businesses, events businesses. You'll find just about every type of business on there. Sarah says, happy to. I'm watching on my phone. Is there a link in the chat? Uh, yes, Sarah, there is a link to the, uh, what do you call it? Google form. Google form. Thank you, Katie, in the chat. Ah, oh, she said she's found it. Excellent. Okay. So there is a link again. So please fill out the Google form there. Um, excellent. If you happen to work for Lego, Merlin, or live or work in an Abri Housing Association, please type that in the chat now by just writing Lego, Merlin, or Abri. Uh, they have shared the event with the people who work for them, and they want to know if you came. So please put that in the chat if you are one of those. Mark O'Donnell's from Abri. Mark, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad it's working. That is the whole purpose of asking this question is to work uh, out if it is working. And then this is your challenge. So you know we like homework. This is your challenge. I want you to idea collect for a week. If you've already got your idea, you can skip this section, but idea collect for a week. Come up with 10 ideas a day and collect them. Then from there, Pick an idea that you want to test. The secret is, doesn't really matter which, just pick an idea and have a go with it. Then we're going to run a mini experiment for two to four weeks. What does that mean? Build a little website page, create an offer, put it out to the market, ask them to buy. Ring all the solicitors, tell them what you're doing, ask them to buy, run a mini experiment. Measure how many calls did I make, how many people did I share it with, measure the progress and the success 
and then we decide whether to push on and do version two or not. Or we go back to the start and create another idea. And we do not care if the first idea works or not. It makes no difference whatsoever. The idea is if it's going to fail, fail as quickly as possible and get on with the next version and then have fun along the way. The more fun you have, the more fun people will have around you. Your energy is infectious. And I gave you that definition of sales right at the start, which is sales is the transfer of enthusiasm from one person to another. So if you aren't enthusiastic about your product, if you aren't having fun, if you aren't full of joy, how do you expect anyone else to connect with you and feel the passion for what you're doing? It has to start inside you and come out. So the root of all of this is the fun and energy from you because life is an adventure. It is an adventure that you can get out there and have. So please stop listening to me and go on an adventure. Get out there, launch a business, test an idea and see what happens. What have you got to lose? Maybe some time, maybe a feeling of rejection. If that's it, I say we have a go and let's build our version of Extraordinary. Thank you so much for coming to tonight's workshop. It has been fun running this with you. I cannot believe how quickly the time has gone. As always, I'm going to end the Zoom in a second. YouTube. Sorry, I'm going to end the YouTube in a second. YouTube people, Gareth, Lauren, Louise, if you want to ask questions, please come over to the Zoom. Katie is putting the link in the chat now. So click on the link and come up over to the Zoom if you want to. Uh, if you're not coming over, please hit like or love or something to show us you enjoyed the workshop. We really appreciate you coming along to the workshop. Uh, YouTube people, thank you so much for coming. Kisses to you all. Go and build your business and make money. People on Zoom, stay where you are. I'm coming for questions. Goodbye, YouTube. Thank you for coming. You're getting a lot of love on YouTube. <laughs>